Good afternoon and welcome to our latest live event from the Great Exhibition Road Festival's Explore at Home series. Uh, my name is James, uh, I work in the public engagement team here at Imperial who are one of the festival partners. Throughout uh, Explore at Home we've been investigating the convergence of, sort of science and engineering and technology with the arts, the creative industries and other areas of culture. Uh, today we're going to be exploring the impact engineering can have on what we eat through a day in the life of Imperial Teaching Fellow Dr Idris Kevin Mohammed. We'll be hearing about Dr Mohammed's exploits with crisps and Kit Kats and blocks of cheese and how this work can help make food tastier, healthier and easier to manufacture. We'll also learn why chocolate is an ideal uh, material for teaching the next generation of engineers. So first of all, thank you so much for joining us and giving us your lunchtime, Idris. Hi James, thanks for having me. Brilliant. So just before we get started, uh, I want to remind all of you watching at home or in your home offices or maybe in offices that this is an interactive event. So please do send us through your questions and thoughts. Uh, I've got my colleagues Holly and Maeve. They're working away in the backgrounds. They're monitoring the YouTube chat and they'll be passing on any comments or questions you have to me and I can put them to Idris or we can have a chat about them. Uh, just I would ask everyone just to be considerate of each other when you are posting. Uh, let's be nice and friendly and uh, uh, yeah. And, and be kind to each other. So if that's all understood and we're all ready to go, uh, let's get on with the event. Uh, Idris, uh, we'll get into the detail of some of those unique research and teaching projects that I mentioned earlier. Uh, we'll get, in, get into those in a second, but I thought it might not be a bad place to start by throwing a few quick fire questions at you to get you warmed up and help our audience get to know a little bit about you and what you do here at the college. Uh, I've got some sentences that I'm going to ask you to complete, if that's OK. Uh, so let's let's go, let's get started. My first one. When friends ask me what I do for a living, I say over to you. Well, at the moment, I say that I am a teaching fellow in the Department of Mechanical Engineering. But uh, a few years ago, when I was I would be asked that question, I would say that um, I would spend my days um, doing experiments on different types of food in the lab and also doing um, finite element simulations of these um, foods. And um, one of the more fun aspects was actually taking different foods and putting it under the microscope to see what it looks like. And we'll have some very, very cool images and videos to, to have a look at what different types of food look under the microscope a bit later on. Uh, we actually had, I had a, a sentence for you to finish and we actually had a question come in from Hayley, which is very similar. Uh, she, she was asking about what a typical day looks like in your job, which is what I was going to ask you. So if you could complete the sentence, a typical day at work involves dot, dot, dot. <laughs> so, um, so at the moment, a typical day involves um, either, well, I would say more, it could be more of a typical week rider. Mm -hmm. It involves um, either giving a lecture or doing tutorials or supervising project students. And they do some really interesting projects. Some of them are actually related to food. Mm -hmm. um, and then um, in between all of those uh, periods when you actually have timetable teaching is actually the preparation for each of those things. So it, there's a lot of uh, behind you behind the uh, scenes that goes into preparing for each of these uh, teaching. Brilliant. And uh, OK, next one. My favourite part of my job is? Um, so, so definitely my favourite part of the job at the moment is just the interaction that I get to have with the students mm -hmm. and being able to communicate with them, see how they think, and then me uh, helping them understand engineering. And then actually, because of my previous research, actually showing them that engineering or at least mechanical engineering isn't just all about cars and engines i'm living proof that you can uh, work on very diverse material and very diverse projects as an engineer so i, 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 like we'll hear, I think we'll hear later obviously this is going to be about the food element which is, is <laughs> about as far away from cars and car engines as you can get but there's also we're also going to be hearing about some projects in the arts and all and like paintings and things like that and so yeah, it really is Mechanical engineering is far more varied than, than the word mechanic or mechanical might might initially uh, might initially conjure up images in people's minds. Okay, so my final uh, quick fire uh, finish a sentence. When I talk about my work, people are surprised by. Um, so initially, what they're most surprised about is actually how much uh, time and work actually goes into, say, prepare. To giving a lecture, most most of them just think that you just rock up to the lecture theater, give a lecture for an hour, but there's so much going on behind it in terms of preparation for it. 
And also the other aspect that they're always most surprised about is when I tell them what I'm actually doing when I say, for example, going to the lab and tell them, oh yeah, today I was um, working on chocolate, for example, or I was sticking a wafer or a crisp under the microscope. Um, sometimes they just don't believe me, but um, <laughs> that's what makes it surprising, I, I suppose. Brilliant. Right. So let's get into some of these slightly unique and interesting projects. Or I guess certainly let's let's look at food from an engineer's perspective, I guess. So I guess when if most people certainly must maybe I'm mostly talking from my own view, I guess if I talked about the science of food, I would think about ingredients, maybe chemistry and things like that. So like the, what, what the food, the sort of the individual elements that go into making the food. And that's what leads to sort of enjoyment or pleasure. But we're talking about the mechanical properties of food. Uh, I mean, it'd be great to hear a little bit about how the mechanical properties of a, of a food, whether it's chocolate or anything, how that is, how we experience that or how that affects our experience of uh, eating it or pleasure of eating it. It'd be good to hear your thoughts on that. Um, so overall when when all of these foods are made um and then people want to know how how's it actually going to taste and uh how's how's it going to feel rather when it's in your mouth and you use tasting panels and everyone's a bit subjective so when when it comes to the engineering aspect it's like how can we actually standardize um and actually quantify these different mechanical properties of the food so for example um if you say baked a wafer for too much it would um influence the structure of it and it might become stiffer and of course th stiffer is uh the engineering description but then what it means when you put it in your mouth is that it then becomes uh, harder to bite so you can literally see if i do tests in the lab that relate stiffness then i can relate it back to for example or try to predict how it might uh, be p perceived when it goes into one's mouth. Yeah, I, I, I guess I guess we're familiar with the term like uh, texture when people talk about food. There's that uh, so people talk about taste and texture as being components of whether something's enjoyable to eat. So I, may, I guess maybe texture is starting to sort of hint towards the engineering mechanical properties of the of the food. But I'd be interested to know whether like whether people can really separate those two in terms of. I, I'm, I'm enjoying this because purely because of the taste or I'm enjoying it actually because of it like melts in my mouth or it's the, it, it behaves in a certain way on my tongue. Yeah, that's actually a, a good question, James, because um, <clears throat> for, for example, if you take a crisp, um, take it fresh out of the packaging, you put it in your mouth and it's nice and it's brittle, it's crispy, or an engineer will say it fractures. And that is what makes a crisp ni nice to, to taste. Um, you leave it out for like an hour and you come back. It's chemically the same thing, but um, you put it in your mouth and it, it's, it's not as crisp as before. It's a bit soggy. And in your mind, you actually start thinking, actually, this crisp doesn't taste as good, but nothing's actually changed it. Mm. Yeah, chemically, it's, it's, I guess it's very similar. It's, it, uh, it's the, the structure it might have changed, I guess. Um, so, yeah, uh, I'd like to get into a, a, a couple of the sort of projects that you've worked on. And I guess the sort of uh, the potential, what you can add to the sort of food industry or our food in terms of with some of these research projects you've been involved in. So one of the things that I'd like you to talk about is the potential for understanding food from an engineering perspective in terms of making it potentially healthier for us without us maybe even noticing. So I know you've been looking at fat content in, in certain products uh, like the dairy industry and things like that. Can you talk a little bit about how, how you could maybe lower fat in, in the dairy products uh, while still it, 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 uh, maintaining sort of our enjoyment of it? Is that, is that something that can be potential if we un could be potentially done if we understand the product from a sort of an engineering perspective? Yeah, so I mean, that, that is true that uh, <clears throat> ideally we're always trying to produce food that's uh, healthier and that's uh, cheaper and of course tastes as good. So for example, with um, cheese, um, if you stick it under a microscope, and I have, <laughs> so I know what it looks like, um, the, the structure of it is it consists of a, a casein uh, protein and within this protein, there's lots of uh, fat globules that are interdispersed within the cheese. 
Um, so it's a fat that kind of gives it this taste and what makes it somewhat more enjoyable. Now, if you have low fat cheese, then this kind of means, well, I then have less fat. From a mechanical perspective, when I look at the cheese with and with, with the fat globules, I look at this and I see it, to me, it looks like a, a composite material. So by removing the fat globules, I've removed some of the particles and therefore the mechanical response of the cheese is gonna be dominated more by the protein matrix than the fat. So in the case of removing the uh, fat, the cheese would tend to behave a bit stiffer. <clears throat> so because it's a bit stiffer, then when you eat it, you have a different perception of how it uh, feels and how it tastes. But if you start modifying the composite material and you start, say, for example, changing the size of the flat globules and dispersing it more, then potentially you have the option or you could result in a cheese material which has a mechanical property which is closer to the normal fat, normal amount of fat in cheese. So hopefully then if you can replicate that mm. with the low fat cheese by modifying its microstructure, then hopefully it will taste very close to the original cheese. And um, in that way, it, it, it tricks you. Mm -hmm. Brilliant. So Mustafa asked a question about whether fats influence taste, I guess. So I guess they, they might do, but they might also influence uh, because of their mechanical properties. They might also influence the sort of the experience of the food in a, in a more sort of textural way as well. As well. Uh, yeah, that's right. I mean, fat, fat clearly does influence the taste. Um, uh, on, on, an, on another project I worked on, and maybe this one's related to something everybody um, can relate to in terms of um, if you have meat or you have a burger or you have a steak, the nicer, juicier steak or the nicer, juicier burger always tends to be the one that has the higher fat content. Um, and when, when we did tests on burgers with low fat content and normal fat content, um, again, there's a direct correlation between the mechanical response of the beef burger patty. And, and I think we've got a picture of the, the burger. I think it's slide number six. We've got a picture of the, the burger in it being analyzed in your lab uh, that we can, uh, we yeah, can show sure. up. There you go. So yeah, talk us through what you were looking at here, uh, Idris. Yeah, so there we have a um, piece of a burger patty and what is being done to it, you can see how, uh, you can just about see a wire so what that wire is connected to an Intron universal testing machine and what it does it goes up and it goes down and it records the force so what we're trying to measure here is how much force is required um, for that wire to cut the burger and of course we had different burgers with different fat contents and also we also try to orient um, the grains of the uh, meat itself to see how much that influenced uh, the mechanical properties. Brilliant. So bear in mind, everyone at home, this is a mechanical engineering department, Imperial. There are, I know we were saying that mechanical engineering isn't just sort of cars, but there are, there, there are parts of it. There are lots of labs where you've got car engines and things like that in there. And in amongst this, we've got a lab which Idris has worked in, which has uh, burgers. And uh, if we can bring up uh, slide number uh, four, Holly, uh, we have we can see a fridge full of cheese, and I'd, <laughs> which is not might might not be what you'd expect. Like these are quite large. This is a normal size fridge that you might have at home. So there's some quite large, uh, 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 some quite large pieces of cheese in there. Um, and I, there was uh, there's another project you worked on which relates to this cheese. So maybe we can keep it up while you're talking about it, Idris. Which has looked at sort of more the operational manufacturing benefits uh, in terms of uh, wire cutting and cheeses. Could you talk a little bit about that? Sure. <clears throat> so I'm, I'm glad we have that image up because um, each of those blocks of cheese was about 20 kilograms worth of cheese. So <laughs> um, yeah, but if you if you kind of let's take a step into the supermarket, for example. <clears throat> and when you go to the supermarket, you have your little blocks of cheese, which are just a few hundred grams. But each of those blocks have actually come from one of these massive 20 kilogram type blocks, um, which means that in the factory, when they're preparing it, they need to cut um, 
little blocks of cheese from these massive blocks of cheese. And um, again, in the supermarket, if you go to one of the uh, high-end ones where you go to the cheese room, um, there's a guy there with a piece of wire and he cuts a nice little slice for you. Um, it's the same process that's going to happen in a, in a factory, except they need to do it on a larger scale with more blocks of cheese. And of course, they need to do it as quick as possible. So what needs to be done is really, if they're going to be using, say, a wire to cut it, you need to optimize that process to know exactly what diameter of wire to use, um, how quickly to cut it, or if you're using a blade, for example, exactly what is the optimum sharpness of the blade or what angle to cut it at. Um, so, and, um, so if you had your normal cheese with normal amounts of fat, you would have optimized that. But like I said, if the, the moment you start messing around with the fat content, the microstructure changes and the mechanical properties changes. So because the properties have changed, that now means you need to re-optimize your process in terms of, again, the same parameters. Because, for example, if you say use the same parameters, this new speed might be too slow or it might be too mm -hmm. high. And if it's, or the diameter might be too big because um, what you also want when you're cutting it is you have like a nice surface finish. Nobody really likes that uh, cheese that looks um, somewhat roughly cut. And secondly, Something that might occur is if you're cutting it too fast, then um, that might generate a bit of heat and it's cheese. So you might end up melting your cheese during the cutting process and you don't want that. I guess so, the, manu the production line is a, is a finely tuned machine, right? So anything, yeah. which, anything which slightly changes, you know, it's not the deli counter at the up e uh, 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 top end supermarket <laughs> with a guy who can maybe adjust for a, for a slightly different uh material than uh, or you know hardness or whatever of cheese it's a it's a machine that can't so you know th this sort of stuff has to be understood before you start feeding cheese into the into the machine i guess yeah uh, i'm gonna exactly. have one more question on cheese before we move on because we've, we've yeah. done we've done quite a lot on cheese so far so uh -huh. the question from anna who asked could the understanding of cheese structure give us a vegan cheese that is cheesy rather than plasticky so i guess it comes back to that sort of experience of food if you change the chemistry can you still can you still give a similar type of experience to what you've had before? Um, yeah, you, I, gu I guess so, that you definitely can, because um, what it is, I guess, you're trying to replicate is the, all, the overall texture of the cheese. And from my perspective, that, that kind of fits in with the mechanical response of the cheese. And it would probably um, involve modifying the microstructure and, and what I mean by that is maybe you might need to put in some additives here and there um, which would help change the structure of the cheese and therefore how it would behave when it's say indented or compressed which is literally what happens in your mouth and hopefully if the mechanical response is different then you might perceive a different taste. Brilliant, all right. We talk, we promised chocolate at the start, so let's get, let's get on to chocolate, <laughs> and in particular, uh, Kit Kats, uh, which you know I think is a, it's a product which it, which I always which does lend itself to mechanical properties. If you think of the lovely snap that people associate with them, um, so uh, I wondered if you could talk a little bit about the pro the, the project you worked on uh, with those sort of chocolate wafers. Uh, uh, what was the what was the sort of issue you were looking at, and and how did you go about solving it? Yeah, um, so so it's almost close to chocolate but uh in that when you think of a kit kat what it's made up is made of uh, layers of wafers with layers of cream in between and then there's a the chocolate all around it so it, when i look at it as an engineer i think of it oh it's a composite material um and then a composite is two different materials next next like layered on top of each other for, yeah that's, yeah, that's, right. so that's yeah. one example of a composite material or a composite material could also be like a material that has particles dispersed okay. within yeah. it so that's how i also looked at the cheese and thought ah, all of these fat globules can be thought of as particles but um back back to the uh wafers mm. so I, I worked specifically on the wafers so that we can understand how it deforms and how it fractures and the reasoning behind it was way before it even gets in your mouth, actually. It was due to the very initial part of the production of the uh, 
wafers in that one is in the factory that they're, they're huge they bake wafers that are about this size so like about half a meter or so but if you've ever eaten a Kit Kat, you know that they all come in very small, well, they call them Kit Kat fingers because I assume each of them is roughly the size of a finger. So imagine going from this big wafer to a small finger of a wafer. It needs to be cut and it's on a, again, it's in a factory and it's an assembly line. So you wanna do it as quickly as possible and as efficiently. Um, but during the cutting process, um, the wafers themselves aren't a perfect homogeneous type material that would be easily to, to cut. It actually has quite an intric intricate uh, microstructure. Um, so because of that kind of complex microstructure, it some tend, during the cutting process, it tends to fracture, not in the perfect uh, rectangular shape that you might want and the fracture part might just veer off to the side and you'd end up with say broken wafers. Nobody wants a broken wafer or a partial wafer in their uh, Kit Kat when they're eating it. So every time that happens it needs to be taken off the assembly line which if you think about it that results in waste. So my project was focusing on determining the material properties of the wafer and then um, predicting how it would fracture so that we could hopefully re control the fracture parts and um, therefore minimize waste. And um, what made it challenging as well is if you're working with say a, a, your standard typical um, engineering type material and you wanted to know the material properties, you you just Google it and go on Wikipedia and you'd see all the material properties there. Can't really do that with the wafer. They don't exist because, for a Kit yeah, Kat wafer. Exactly. Well, they do now because I've done it. <laughs> <laughs> they do now. <laughs> they didn't. Okay, you're right. Um, but a question from Vivian, which I think applies particularly to this project. I mean, you might have a cheese lover as well, but that cheese in the fridge didn't look particularly appetizing. But she asked, uh, do you ever have problems with re your researchers or maybe yourself, Idris, uh, eating your samples when they're working late in the lab? <laughs> it didn't even have to be working late, actually. <laughs> um, I, I do, I mean, with, with cheese, for example, sometimes it was just tempting to like, ah, here's a block. It's a shame for it to go to waste. I want <laughs> Oh, you just want to try it sometimes. Or um, when I worked with crisps, um, when I was doing the experimental testing, you know, when you have a bag of crisps, some of the crisps and crisps end up being broken, and you have like halves of them. But I wanted to actually test an entire crisps. So every time I had the bag, I would take out all the perfectly still in one piece crisps, lay them out, and then without actually thinking, I just pick one up, put it in my mouth and then think, no, I, I just spent the last half an hour sifting through bags of crisps to find a perfect one and I've just wasted a sample by putting it in my mouth. So, so yeah, it does happen. It's very honest of you. So the crisps that you didn't ruin by eating, you did, you did manage to put some of them under, uh, I think it was a, is it electron microscope or a 3D imager anyway. Uh, and I think we've got a video of that. So we can, we can, we can dive inside a crisp. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about what we're looking at here? Yeah, so what, what this is, is actually um, a crisp um, that we put into a CT scanner. And um, what we, what then able to do when, when, when you CT scan um, any material or an object, you get like multiple cross sections of its uh, internal structure. And if you put all of those cross sections together, you can actually get a 3D image. Um, so what we're looking at here is part of a crisp reconstructed in 3D. And um, here you can actually see what the internal microstructure looks like. So you can tell that it's actually quite porous. It even kind of looks like a cave network, if you want to say. And I should point out that you can't really see this with um, by just looking at it with your eye, because if you think about a crisp and you're looking at a cross section, um, I mean, what is it, like a millimeter thick, two millimeters at most, a crisp? So that what we're looking at here is actually a cross section of a crisp. That is, yeah, that is a, a, a thing that I didn't expect to be looking at, or I didn't expect to be diving inside a crisp with uh, on my front Friday lunchtime. 
uh, not, well, uh, so, yeah, you, unique you experience. You should have seen the expression on the, uh, the lab technician when I approached him and said, um, I'd like to put this in your expensive piece of equipment. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, it'd be interesting to talk about your lab and, and what you, so what you have there, what type of equipment, because it, I guess it, it's, it's the, whilst the materials might be slightly unusual, the equipment isn't, it's not necessarily bespoke or it's not, it, it, it's kind of standard engineering type equipment that you can use. You're just putting something slightly unusual in it. Is, is, is that fair? Yeah, that is actually a very uh, accurate description. because um, So within the labs, we have, um, well, we already showed the uh, Intron Universal uh, Testing Machine, which records force and displacement. And if you have the right grips, you can do all kinds of experiments on it, like bending, compression, indentation, cutting, um, tensile, of course. Um, and then, of course, we have microscopes. So um, have scanning electron microscope and normal optical microscope. And like you said, people put their samples in there. It just so happens that quite a few of my samples happen to um, happen to be food, actually. Mm. I mean, yeah, some of the looks and, and questions you must get from sort of the technicians who kind of, you know, th th those pieces of equipment are like their babies, you know, they're, they're the things they manage on a day to day basis. And you, you come along with a packet of crisps or, uh, <laughs> yeah, they, they, they must they must have, I don't know, look in horror or bemusement. I, I don't know. What yeah, or, or walking in with chocolate and um, they're just thinking, don't make a mess in my lab. Don't bring ants. <laughs> Brilliant. Um, uh, we're going to talk about some other non-food or how the same principles apply to some non-food projects. I, I just before we did that, I was interested in sort of a lot of the, what we talked about so far is kind of standard, very familiar, very sort of almost everyday food uh, food products or food uh, materials, I guess that we're all familiar with. But sort of the future of food, we, uh, this is this sort of work uh, or this sort of research is going to be sort of fundamental to things that people have talked about sort of lab grown meat and they've talked about 3d printing food and things like that which sound very futuristic uh but that's sort of that that's something that this type of research is going to play a part in both of those i would imagine um yeah and, and I'm, I'm glad you uh, brought up uh, the 3d printing of food because uh i mean 3d printing seems like a novelty these days these days and um you've just got different materials so why not uh, put food in it so a few years back, uh, me and one of my other colleagues, uh, Connor, um, he he taught, let's try to have a student project to build a 3D food printer. And um, students were quite successful. We learned a lot during the process in that we learned, for example, um, when it comes to printing food, a little bit of it is a novelty because you print fancy shapes. Um, but then sometimes you're limited with the type of material that you can actually use. I wonder if we can, sorry, just uh, we can bring up, a, uh, as you're talking, we can bring up a, a sort of a little video of, of, of three. If, yeah, if you want to talk, oh, keep, yeah. keep going and just tell us what so we're that, looking that, at that's here. That's a perfect example, right? Yeah, so it, it's a bit of a novelty and we're printing a really fancy type shape, but the material that we're using here is um, um, icing. So because of the way the 3D printer works, you're limited with the types of materials that you can use because it needs to be at some point it needs to be liquid and then when it comes out it needs to be solidified really quickly so another material that you can actually use is chocolate um something that's also um not always clear when it comes to 3d food printing is that in your mind you think of like star trek and you think uh, you push the button, it prints the food, and then you can just eat it. Um, but most of the time, what the 3D food printers do is just they print something that looks nice, and then they leave out that little fine print that says, uh, now stick it into the oven after it's printed. Um, so what we also tried to do was um, build a 3D food printer that could actually bake brownies so that once it's printed, you can actually eat it. Um, <laughs> So that was quite neat. It was relatively successful, but as you can imagine, when it comes to the 3D food printing or 3D printing in general, it's, it was quite slow. So we did end up with brownies that were about this big. Oh, the, the nuggets of brownie. Yeah. <laughs> but step one. <laughs> step one, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, like I said, I think it would be good to sort of 
for a moment deviates away from food and talk about how because it's not just food that, uh, that this sort of, these sort of principles um, uh, can be applied to. We had a question from Sophie who actually asked, could you apply your understanding of food structure such as chocolate to other real life structures? Uh, and I think, yeah, we got you. I know that your group, you talk about food as like a soft solids or soft materials and that, that's a that's a broad church of, of materials it'd yeah. be good to talk about some of the other things that you can apply very similar sort of approaches models that you develop for food to them to understand to understand other types of materials yeah so well i'm, I'm glad um sophie's asked that question about chocolate with other real life um structures and materials because um yeah chocolate is a great one because um chocolate is the food and as an engineer or mechanical engineering steel is probably the most used material and you might not think of it at first but there is actually quite a lot in common between chocolate and steel um in order to make them uh <clears throat> you actually have to heat them up and then cool them down and depending on what temperature you heat it to or how fast you heat it up how long you keep it at that temperature, and then again, how much, how quickly or slowly you cool it, you end up with a totally different um, structure of material with different type of properties. So you, as an engineer, you would come across um, terms like annealing and quenching, which all relate to um, the heat treatment of the process. Whereas in chocolate, you might come across the word tempering of chocolate. And tempering of chocolate, um, I've tried it myself and it, it isn't as easy as all those YouTube videos make it out to seem because you actually need to be quite scientific and quite precise in controlling temperature, controlling the cooling rate. But if you get properly tempered chocolate, the, the structure of it is that nice glossy finish. And mm -hmm. it also has that nice brittle, brittle fracture um, when you snap it. I learned the hard way. If you don't temper it properly, then it has like, it, it doesn't look as nice and then when you actually try to snap it it's actually quite ductile and you see it behaving really plastic plastically um and it you just don't it doesn't look appealing to want to put into your mouth um so so yeah i, I quite like the analogy between steel and chocolate and last year i actually had a project student um working on on it as well his name was hayato and um he did a really good job because what he did was he had different um, chocolates in terms of different cocoa contents and also milk contents. And the analogy to that as well is when you have steel, steel is basically a combination of uh, iron and carbon. So if you kind of think, okay, if we adjust the amount of carbon content in the steel, it results in different hardness values, for example. And in much the same way, if you have um, normal milk chocolate or dark chocolate, it affects um, the structure of the chocolate and the hardness of the chocolate as well. So, so because of the amount of cocoa content. So um, <clears throat> it's quite a cool experiment and I do hope to actually continue doing more experiments on chocolate like that to say what happens when you add some additives in, what happens if you say, um, try, to, try to add some brandy in, for example, how does that affect? the uh chocolate mechanical properties and yeah absolutely and we'll talk that that sort of the ability of chocolate and its links to or it's as an, an analogous uh, material to steel i guess that's informed some of your teaching which will we'll come on to some of your teaching of uh of, of undergraduates uh, imperial in a second i just wanted to talk in terms of other materials so you've got steel um, there's also, uh, I know that it's not something you've worked on directly, but some of your colleagues have looked at things like paint in the art world. So there's like conservation and restoration, or conservation particularly, I guess, of, of classical paintings and the behavior of paint it, it can is also like it, it's termed or it can be defined as like a soft solid or a soft material in that sense. Can, can you talk a little yeah. bit about that? Yeah, that's right. So, so the paint project was um, done by uh, my colleagues here. So Professor Maria Charalambida, she was in charge of the project. And then uh, Joe Wood was the guy who was um, who was supposed to working on it. And um, and essentially, these paints, I think they're medieval paintings. And um, over time, so they're hundreds of years old, I, I believe. And over time, um, due to the storage conditions, because the temperature fluctuates, the humidity fluctuates, 
and they don't just fluctuate on a daily basis because this is England and the weather is always changing. So it fluctuates on a, um, on a monthly basis or even an annual basis as well. So because of those changes in temperature and humidity, cracks form on the paints. And the idea is, well, you want to preserve those paintings so you don't want them to crack. Can we predict the crack patterns and what is causing the paints to crack over time? Um, and the way in which um, Joe did this was he used finite element modeling and um, to predict the crack parts. And well, in terms of defining the material behavior of the paint, this is where it kind of links back to say foods and adhesives, for example, in that it's a soft material and it's a viscoelastic material. Um, as we would describe it in engineering. And what that means is that at different, um, if you deform the material at different rates, it actually has different material properties. So using one set of equations that define a viscoelastic material, you can actually predict how a wide range of different materials behave, whether it could be cheese or it could be an adhesive in a drug patch or it could be this painting in medieval. and once you understand how a material behaves and you understand the maths and the equations that define it, then at some point you kind of just forget what you're actually mm. um, working with because you just you just start seeing uh, numbers and equations and yeah. forget that it's paint or cheese or whatever. Yeah, but in terms of the management of these materials in the, in the art world, that could be conservation or how it's how it's kept. That like the, this sort of behaviour is uh, understanding it and predicting it and how it might go going forward is and how you could how it would react to like things like temperature and sunlight exposure or whatever it is that's that's really really valuable um yeah now you can you can you can definitely see how this you know your the the, the research area you guys are focused on there's all different areas where it could be applied to probably people can come to you with or i hope maybe they do now people come to you with sort of project ideas um but I wanted to come back to the let's talk, let's talk about the teaching because you you started to hint at how chocolate and steel and steel being such a fundamental material in mechanical engineering it's it, it let chocolate lends itself to that well you've brought that into now as a, te a teaching fellow at Imperial you've kind of brought that into the the curriculum I guess in uh, the, uh, the undergraduate curriculum not not, yeah. not quite yet but I'm trying to oh, yeah. that's um, the, that's the so aim. That, that's, um, yeah that what what would be like the aim and, and what kind of inspired it actually was when I met um, Luke and Jacob from the chemistry department and they showed me their chemical kitchen and in, the, in their chemical kitchen they just used a normal chemistry lab but what they do there is they use food as their samples to actually show how to show students how the machines work show them how to actually um, be safe in a lab as well and I thought that was a really cool idea and really cool concept and um, maybe we could do that in mechanical engineering. So that's why last year I, I had a student project, um, finally a project um, called Mechanical Kitchen. And the idea was to see how can we actually use food and food products in, um, in the lab to demonstrate principles that we come across in mechanical engineering. So the student was Hayato who, who worked on it and what he, the experiments he came up with was uh, using pasta um, that was boiled to different times times to demonstrate how a material behaves under creep, which is um, how a material deforms when it just when you just hang a load on it and see how it deforms over time. Um, another thing he looked at was um, measuring the stresses in pressure vessels and what you might think, okay, wait, pressure vessels, how's that related to food? What one example is um, if you have a grill a hot dog, um, that that's technically a pressure vessel, and and you'll see that every time the hot dog splits, it always splits along the vertical line, and it never actually splits around the circumference, and that's due to stress analysis. So that can be explained with engineering. <laughs> but, but what Hayato actually did was um, he used a coke can, um, which in itself has pressurized liquid in it. And then the idea was to measure what the change in pressure is when you open the Coke can. And of course, the, the main thing that he did, which we mentioned earlier, was him uh, testing chocolate. 
Um, yeah, I think we've got a video that we can show from the from the mechanical kitchen project. So if we could, I think that's a is that slide seven. I think we can get that up. I wonder is also we could maybe post a link to the chemical kitchen. Uh, there's there's been some stories written about that. So that's like that's I guess this is a, an aspirational project in a sense from Idris's perspective. But the chemical kitchen is an up and running project, looking at similar using food to look at chemistry in terms of its principles and lab work and things like that. So if, if we can post a link to that in the chat, you can get a sense of what it looks like in the chemistry department. And uh, you can kind of start to envisage how this could have how this could work for, for engineers as well. So yeah, Idris, do you want to tell us what's happening in this video? Um, yeah, I just wanted to add on as well that uh, with the chemical kitchen, the first year they ran it, it was actually in the lab. But because of the uh, challenges of the last uh, academic year, they've, they've modified it so that all all the testing could be done at home, which was really cool. Um, but what's actually happening in this video is that that white uh, sample that you see there is a block of milk chocolate, and it's being impacted with that hammer. So that entire test setup is called a choppy impact test. And what, and what it measures is how much energy is required to break a material. So what we did was, um, well, what Hayato did was um, test different chocolates with different um, cocoa contents to see how much energy is required to break the chocolate, um, depending on the amount of cocoa content in the chocolate. And also as well, depending on how he actually performed the heat treatment in terms of um, melting the chocolate and then cooling it back down as well okay so we've got we've got about five minutes left idris so what i'm gonna do is i'm gonna fire some questions we've had through to you if you can sort of be relatively brief in your answers it means we can get through <laughs> uh, so got, we had a question from girthy who asked uh, can you suggest any experiments we can do with food in the classroom uh so is there any sort of like basic ones where you can start to understand uh, sort of the engineering or mechanical properties of food. I, I've seen you do something with arrows before. I don't know if that's something you could talk about. Um, so something that I was actually doing at home was when I was actually playing around with chocolate, um, which is something you can do at, at home actually, is you have your chocolate bar. And if you find two supports, which are the same length, you can um, put your chocolate bar across it and then hang weights on it to see how much force or how much weight is required to break it. And then if you have like say different types of chocolate you can make that like a, as a fun activity and you can relate it to actually beam theory within um stress analysis of mechanical engineering so so hopefully I, I, I will um come up with something more <laughs> um, and written down to do we had a question from lib d who asked uh this is a while uh, a while ago earlier on in the event who asked what interested you most in this area of engineering what did, did you start out being a, with ambitions to be a food fit engineer or were you uh, uh, looking um, at car en car engines like other people when you were No, I did not actually think at all when I started mechanical engineering that I would one day be working on different food products. So I guess what actually interested me was when I saw what was being done and I thought that is actually pretty cool that you can apply engineering to non-standard engineering materials and um, yeah, it, I mean, that that is literally what interested me, actually, the fact that it just seemed cool. Yeah, great. Uh, we had a question from Kathy. I think I sort of hinted at this earlier about whether you choose projects or the projects come to you. She asked, how do you choose which products or food to examine? So, yeah, what uh, have so, you reached a level of notoriety that people come to you now? So in, in the past, um, the, the projects would actually most of the food product projects I've worked on um, were postdoc projects, and they were under Maria, Professor Maria Carolyn Bidez, who's here in McKinch as well. And um, so they came to her really, and then that's so the, and then I worked on it. So the projects came to me. However, now that I'm a, I'm a, I'm a teaching fellow here in the department, I I I'm a lot. I, I get to supervise finally a project students, which means now I can create projects. And that is how, for example, I ended up working on chocolate last year because I then thought it would be a cool project to work on chocolate. So now I choose the projects uh, on, I choose the foods, I would say. Brilliant. 
Um, we had another question from uh, Lib D who asked about um, uh, A levels or degree you would recommend to look into this area. So, yeah, to get into this area of study, uh, uh, what sort of A levels or degrees should people be studying? And we also had a question from Jeremy uh, who sent it in beforehand about what should you study at school if you want to be if you want to get into this area of engineering. So, yeah, if you could talk a little bit about that. Um, well, I guess I could answer it from my perspective, which is I, I got into this by doing mechanical engineering. Um, and I never actually taught mechanical engineering would involve, say, working on drug patches or um, different foods. So I guess I would say, from my perspective, I would just say it would be at least maths and physics, really, because that's where you would need to be an engineer. And then once you become an engineer, you can choose what you want to specialize in. Brilliant. And then final question from Amanda. What, uh, what's the strangest food you've ever had to test? Now, this might be also be what's the uh, food that has annoyed the lab technicians most? I don't know. But yeah, maybe start with strangest. Uh, the strangest, I would probably say um, maybe flour. Um, like self-raising flour? Um, well, well, we, my colleague was working on dough. So mm -hmm. we thought, let's take it a step back and looking at dough under the microscope. So we thought, let's take it a step back and actually say, what does flour look like under the microscope? And um, yeah, that, that was different, definitely a challenging one because flour is a powder. So getting a sample prepared to look at under the microscope was um, challenging. So I guess that's probably the most challenging one. Um, probably not the strangest one. Um, but yeah, that, that, that's definitely the first one that comes to mind. Brilliant. OK, uh, I think that's just about all we have time for today. Uh, so, yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Idris, for joining us and telling us all about your work and, and good luck with your, the future of the, your teaching uh, program at Imperial. Uh, yeah, the future. Uh, there's going to be some very fortunate uh, future undergraduate mechanical engineers who get to do some some things they might not have realized when they signed up to the course but i'm sure they'll be delighted when they get met with a, a load of liquid chocolate or some chocolates to work on um for those who are watching us live on youtube thank you so much for all your questions uh, i'm sorry we couldn't get through all of them and we try to get through as many as we can um if you have if you want to watch this again or you want to send it to some friends or, or other people uh, a recording of this this discussion will soon appear on the uh, great exhibition road festival youtube channel uh, that's all that's also where all future videos uh, that we make in terms of talking to scientists artists for, uh, doing sort of art works art science workshops things like that they will all be appear there, both live streamed and also recorded. So, yeah, do follow us. Give our YouTube channel a little follow and you'll get notifications when these things are happening. Um, there'll also be my colleagues will be posting a quick uh, evaluation form uh, in the in the chat. So if you could if you could spare literally two minutes of your time or a couple of minutes of your time just to let us know what you thought about this event. Uh, we would really appreciate your feedback. We sort of review them on a month by month basis and they really do inform how we go about organizing these events, the sort of topics we choose, that type of thing. But otherwise, I think I think that's it from me. Uh, Idris, thank you so much for your time. Uh, cool. Thanks uh, for having me, James. I had a great time. About your work. Cool. Thanks for having me. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you to Idris. Thank you to all of you, uh, again, who are watching us at home. I wish you all a very uh, good Friday afternoon. Uh, maybe you'll look at what's in your fridge in a slightly different way. Have a, enjoy your lunch if you haven't got through to, got to it yet. Uh, and that's all from us at the Great Exhibition Road Festival. Thank you so much.